Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, this is our first true community gathering of 2024, a number I try to keep in my head when I'm writing checks. <laughs> we all forget that. It's we all, I mean, everybody's going to write a check to 2022 and have to 2023 and have to uh, cross it out and do it again. So um, we've been doing this since 2020, April 17th. Uh, this is the true community gathering. We uh, st started this as a community service. Uh, because people were in shutdown and were feeling lonely and isolated and didn't know what to do with themselves. And who knew, but I discovered there was something called Zoom and I was able to open up a Zoom room and welcome people in here. And we're continuing a community. And what was also interesting was what was at one time the true New York community has grown to be the, tr the true global community. Um, we often have people in from all over the world as, as well as all over the country. Uh, I think in general, people outside of New York uh, outnumber the people that are in New York uh, when we do these now. Um, so our conversations have, have changed over the over the two and a half, three uh, over the three years. Um, I, I, I do my weekly reminder. Sure, yeah, yeah. We're no longer in COVID, right? We're not in shutdown. There's no COVID, right? Wrong. There's COVID. <laughs> COVID is out there. COVID is getting a lot of people sick uh, every every week. Now that I'm doing the true, uh, true community gatherings um, in what is a post-shutdown world, I always have more people in my room who have COVID than, than I did during shutdown. So um, everybody be careful, be aware of it, be conscious. There are people around you who may not be as hardy as you and may be more susceptible to this. So be conscious and be, um, just be conscious and, and careful um, and considerate. Uh, so uh, now that we're out of the shutdown world, but we're in a world that <laughs> supposedly resembles normalcy, uh, although God knows there's nothing normal about the world that we're, that we're seeing right now. Um, I won't get political, but let's, let's just say that I wish things were a little different, a little bit more balanced right now. Uh, there's a lot of craziness going on. So with all the craziness that's going on around us, um, I consider myself and I consider us all lucky to have a theater community that we can be part of. Um, and uh, I like to find people who do interesting things in theater that we can talk about um, and for an hour conversation. Uh, I'm one of these people, I, I get tons and tons and tons of emails and I used to be able to like delete them now I actually read them to see if somebody that's sending me something is somebody that is really interesting and some, something that would be worth talking about and exploring uh, in this post-shutdown world of theater. Um, in this case, however, I got an email from my friend Tita. And my friend Tita had been in uh, California and she had experienced something that she found very profound and pro profoundly move moving. And she discovered uh, a company out there called the LAPD. Uh, not not the one that you know. No, no, it's not people in blue. It's basically people who are uh, homeless, the, the Los Angeles Poverty Department. Uh, who knew? I didn't know that this existed. But there's a man named John Malpede, one of the unsung heroes of theater in, in a way, uh, who uh, recognized a need and came in and filled it and has created something that is really changing lives. Uh, all of us as, as artists, we always hope to change lives with our work. Um, sometimes you change it with writing, sometimes you change it with art, sometimes you change it with just working with people and finding ways of, of helping people. Um, and I'm gonna bring John in right now and we're gonna talk, we're gonna have a little conversation about who he is and what he does. Uh, so John, welcome to True. Uh, I'm sorry you had to travel all the way here from Los Angeles, but thanks for being with us. You're welcome. It was quite a schlep. Yeah, it was quite a schlep, I'm sure. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself before we talk about LAPD. There was a John Malpede before there was an LAPD. Um, and, and I think it might also give us a little uh, insight into how you, how and why you've created um, this company that has been around uh, for 39 years. So uh, bless your heart for, for your persistence. That's one, that's one of my gifts. P persistence <laughs> i've been doing this for 30 some of us some of us have persistence um and you certainly are one of them 
uh, I read in the I Ching that perseverance furthers. And, uh, uh, the I Ching, ah, yes. Perseverance. I, 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 I've had, had you, we've all had moments when we, when we wonder, <laughs> when we wonder whether it's, it really is further or whether we're just in a, in a, I don't know, some sort of cycle. But um, yeah, I think if, I think if you stick to things and if you believe in them enough, uh, you can make, make things matter and make things important happen, which is what I think. With, you've I, with regard to, with with regard to this issue, I was, you know, I was living, in, I was living in New York uh, before I happened to move out here, which was coincident with with getting involved in Skid Row and and what turned out to be LA Poverty Department. But I was, I was, I was a self taught performance artist in New York. You know, as, as I always say, like, uh, you know, only only preachers and artists can just hang out a shingle and announce that they're doing in business. You know, if you're a barber, you need a license, but as an artist, you don't. So. So you know, I got my my um, as well as an early member of uh, LAPD used to say, the guy has many degrees but not twenty five cents worth of street smarts. Well, I got my uh, my arts education, you know, in basically in Lower Manhattan, you know, going to different workshops and stuff like that. But I don't have any. I'm not a degreed uh, arts person at all. But I like you know, I went to a lot of the first class I ever went to was with Simone Forti, the, the dancer who, uh, anyway, in New York. Well, so, I, so anyway. Well, I, I have a question for you about this, uh, just because we talk about performance art, and I, I think a lot of us have a vague idea of what it is. What what does performance art mean to you? I mean, well, you know, a lot of times, I, I found it a lot of times like the 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 labels come afterwards. Like I said, I, le I learned, I was, uh, I was I was making work and I and friends of mine had been were in the NYU theater program and I started making work with them. We thought so we thought we were doing experimental theater and then we ran into uh, I met another guy who who had come from an art school, who uh, Michael Smith, who's a, who's a performance art, an artist in New York. He said, "Well, what you guys are doing is performance art," and then so I was like, "I don't care if someone will let us do something somewhere, we'll do it." You know, what do we care? So, so what was it you, what was it you were doing? What was it? So tell us a little bit about what you were doing. That particular thing was it was an ongoing two person, character-based improvisation. So, so um, I had a and it came out of a out of an a group improvisation. But I had a character named Lonely Horse, and my uh, my friend Bill Gord had a character named Dead Dog, and these guys, we never we never rehearsed as these characters. We did things like we learned to yodel and we did different things, but we never, uh, we, uh, we uh, the characters only existed in, in performance. And we did performances. Um, the first one we ever did was on the Battery Park City Landfill, uh, you know, on the west side of Manhattan. And we did ones in moving vans and hotel rooms and uh, the Three Mercer Street store, which was a little performance space on at Three Mercer Street. <laughs> And uh, other play, you know, we did it sometimes in art spaces like Franklin Furnace and things like that, but also in in uh, yeah in uh, you know in in non traditional. We did one in L.A. when we first came. We traveled to L.A. and we did one on the set of another show, you know, when it wasn't happening. So we would just use yeah, that was part of the thing. But but in any case, the history the history of these characters developed. The premise was that it was going to be you know, um, as non-theatrical as possible. But, and, but, you know, what happened was we would, we would perform and then that would become real history. We really did that. And then the, 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 the stuff we made up that happened during that would also become part of this history. So it was an amalgam of, uh, you know, places we'd actually been and places we claimed to have been and things we really did and claims, things we claimed we did and all that kind of stuff. But, it, but the premise was it was like, just like any other people in a normal relationship, as you get to know a person better, the, it accumulates in that way. So that's what we were trying to do, just accumulate in that way and in no, no other way. So, so okay, so your, your, your background was as a performer, performance art, whatever you want to call it, but you were, you were a performer. Uh, how did you stumble onto the realization that there were people 
living in our communities that were deeply, deeply in need. Well, you know, I mean, I was living, I was living in the East Village in the early eighties, and uh, but it, you know, right, you know, four or five blocks from the men's shelter, but. But you know, suddenly at the, in the early '80s, you started seeing a lot more people sleeping on the street, you know. And so, uh, you know, the 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 question was why. And and as I I said to you, Bob, earlier when we were just talking, the two of us, there was I, I a group called Creative Time, which is a which is a longstanding uh, arts group in LA that I mean in Los in New York that in New gets. York, yeah. uh, Produces work in all genres, but in different, but in non, you know, in non-art settings. They use the city, you know, in, uh, to create venues for work. And they had the I mentioned it because ten years earlier it was this landfill, but it was still a landfill in the '80s when they took it over and they invited a bunch of, they invited I don't know eight or ten sculptors or visual artists and performers to form you know little groups and create create something that would happen there over the summer. So the sculptures were there the whole time, and then each week one of the uh, these collaborators would do a performance. And so, so I was invited to do that with Laurie Hawkinson, who's an architect, and uh, Erica Rothenberg, who's a visual artist. And we, um, but and we built something called the Freedom of Expression National Monument that pointed across the street. It was a twenty foot megaphone on a ramp, and you could go scream anything you wanted at the powers that be. It was pointed to the then World Trade Center because this was in nineteen eighty four. And um, and then I knew I would then I was going to make a I knew I could use it in making a performance about homelessness, um, and of course the the where that site was you know dirty Hudson River water they put sand into it and poof they created the world's most expensive at that time real estate so it was a real um, it was a fitting site for for such a thing, and uh, but I was in L.A. when I was writing the piece which was that summer. And it was right before the Olympics in LA. And so in LA, there were a lot of, um, there was a lot of concern about beautifying the city. And and uh, and so there were police sweeps of, of areas with homeless people. And there were uh, hearings at the board of County Board of Supervisors around the welfare system. And so I went to that and I, um, I met a bunch of homeless people, uh, people from Skid Row and act activists from Skid Row who were testifying about the conditions of hotels that people were being sent to for, by the county for housing, which were deplorable. And so I started volunteering with those guys. I was able to write a performance that was really quite accurate and quite hallucinated at the same time, which is about two guys who had given been given one-way bus tickets to, uh, to travel America and tell the Americans about the Olympic update report. Because in fact, people were being given, oh, and this is called Greyhound therapy. And in fact, that was really happening. People were being given one-way bus tickets to leave town, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, uh, so, so um, Ron, Ron DeSantis didn't invent that. No, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a bit in the playbook for a long time. Wow. Yeah. So, um, so uh, my, my, my question, my, my the thing that's, that you take this for for granted, uh, I think, because it's so, it's so much a part of who you are and what you've been doing, but not everybody would look at homelessness and people living on the streets and say theater could help these people what 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 was it that what was your thought process how did you feel like you could bring how art how did you feel that why did you feel that art could actually help these people well first of all i didn't you know i mean on the one hand i didn't know if this was a this hairbrand idea was going to last more than five minutes but um but because I ended up doing it in conjunction with people who had a lot of credibility in the community, um, people were, people got engaged. But I also thought, you know, as as someone, you know, as since I was, you know, doing performance art, right, which is really about, oftentimes about, you know, the the uniqueness of each individual. I just thought like, you can expand, you can expand that. Uh, to include more individuals, and I, you know, and I do believe that everybody has uh, not a story, you know, but a million infinite, um, you know, stories, concerns, and uh, and that everyone is unique and and 
and and beautiful in their own way. That's well. That's were you amazing. were you welcomed immediately into the community? Did you have to win the trust? I mean, how how did you become part well, of? That's it? Like a, yeah, that's a good question. Like I said, I went to this government hearing and I met people from the homeless organizing team, which had come out of the uh, the Catholic Worker, which I knew from New York. Right? You guys, do you guys know the Catholic Worker? It's, you know, it, it was started in the 30s by Dorothy Day and Peter Moran. And they were the first, you know, to, as a soup line for the, during the Depression. And they had a newspaper and they, they were the first people to protest the atom bomb, blah, blah, blah. So there's a long history of, uh, of, of activism and also of uh, uh, hospitality houses where they feed, feed people and, and do hospice for people who are you know, dying and things like that. So, wow. so they, they, now they're now they're Catholic workers, you know, houses in different parts of the country, and th there was one in L.A. that started in 1970, and uh, so those guys, th so that's who I started uh, volunteering with before I, and they had a they had a, a law clinic that was spinning off into a nonprofit, and th and those guys asked me to be, you know, to do, we wrote a grant to the California Arts Council actually about doing. Uh, workshops there so so without that without the you know that's what made it i i feel like that's what made it successful that i that i in fact worked with the people who had the most trust in the community and in which community members were very active and uh and they they also educated me on how to behave you know and so it was uh oh I, explain I that, that a little bit explain it well they knew the, that community has is is uh, is built on you know compassionate knowledge, and they know how to how to the people in this Catholic work community know how to treat people to bring out the best out of them, rather than antagonize people or belittle them or something like that. So, um, so uh, I I learned from being around those guys how to behave. So. I'm calling from this that there were two basic art forms that you were that you practiced. You were you were a performer. You you you. I mean, you were a form of actor. You you performed. It sounds yeah. like you also were yeah. a writer. So you you were also writing yeah, pieces. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And after that improvisational piece, then I started writing. Uh, after Dead Dog and Lonely Horse, which went on for a couple of years, seventy seven and seventy nine, and then in eighty, I started writing. Uh, monologues actually yeah I wrote and I wrote and I wrote about four of them that were performed at places like well I don't know the new museum just above Midtown the kitchen Franklin Furnace places like that and then uh and the last one the last one was this one uh Olympic Update Homelessness in Los Angeles which was based on uh, my experiences in Los Angeles during the, during the Olympics but I performed it you know, first in New York because that's where on that on that landfill that I was talking about. Well, you 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 already said that you that you uh, you didn't know that this was an idea that was going to last more than five minutes. So you so you started you entered you entered the community you you created something that you hoped would be meaningful. Um, how did it evolve over the years, and and is what you do, is what you do now much different than what you did when you were first starting with working with the communities? And the, I have another question I'm going to ask you too about community, but we'll get to that. Okay. Yeah. So so um, you know we we started making um, actually I guess, I guess a better a better way of tell, saying this is what were you what did you learn when you started working with these people? that helped you to adjust and adapt what you're doing so that it would be more more meaningful um well i would say like everything you know all the things i had done beforehand were turned out to be useful you know but we started when we first started working um for the most part <laughs> we made we made performances with um <clears throat> through improvisation with no script where, where we would have a scenario, you know, the list of scenes eventually, and we would, um, but the but the lines weren't set, and uh, and we and they and they would play out, you know, more or less the same or sometimes radically different each time we did it, and uh, and this this um, 
did a bunch of things. And one, it, it got a lot, everybody involved, and it also um, it didn't require it didn't require reading, because a lot of times, you know, it's a lot easier to talk than it is to read something, um, and so so it. Um, I forget what your question is, but basically, it's just sort of like again, it's about the people in the room and working with the people in the room and finding what works. It's like, you know, it's like being a, it's like being a basketball coach or something. You got all these guys on the bench, and you this year you have somebody who can shoot three pointers, so you put them in the game, and next year you don't, so you do something else. You know, it still seems magical to me. It just seems it seems like, I mean, the way you tell it, it sounds like it just happened, and I'm sure it didn't just happen. Um, did people come to you? Did you come to them? Did you recruit people? Did you see somebody and say, "I think, I think, I'd love to have you be part of this group. I'd love, I'd love to have you express yourself through theater." How did you explain this to people who may not have known what theater was? Um, a lot of people, of course. What was interesting, a lot of people. Well, first of all, like I said, I was embedded in in uh, in the in the, the Catholic Worker, and then it spun off into inner city law, and they also. At that time, they also hired me as an outreach uh, paralegal. So in the summer, I mean, a worker, or, uh, yeah, paralegal. So so my job was to go out into the street and help people get, you know, help people with housing issues or get them, uh, you know, get them welfare or whatever. So I, ultimately, I ended up going to spending time at every welfare office in the city, in the county of L.A., making sure that people got what they deserved. So. I knew a lot of people, and the, where I was working, everybody knew a lot of people, and so, so, and they had a lot of trust, and so, and a lot of people, actually, you know, had um, at the beginning of LAPD, people would show up with, you know, the the twelve rap songs that no one had ever listened to, you know, the film script no one had ever read, the, um, you know, and everybody had many of the people had uh, had done things artistically or 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 saw themselves as doing artistically. And um, and so it, and and people were happy to have a, a place a place to get together and 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 uh, hopefully get someone to listen to one of the twelve rap songs. You know, you know what that's like. So so do you hear, so, do you, do you hear a dog barking in my background? No. Okay. You don't hear it. Okay. I would. I didn't know whether to mute myself or not. No, I'm sorry. You don't have to be. Yeah. So basically, so, um, um, what what you said to me just now was actually pretty extraordinary to me. I I, I don't know if it did other people the same way, but you're saying that there were a lot of people in this community who already were predisposed to art. They, they already see, saw yeah. themselves having artistic gifts. Um, so uh, th that's that's pretty amazing. Um, it's also it's also a little a little sad. Um, this, this is a rough rough world, isn't it? The people that are having such a, a difficult time, they wind up on Skid Row. Um, that's I, I I'm trying to grasp it all. It's 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 beyond. It's a little bit beyond beyond my experience. So um, God bless you for doing what you were you, what you've been doing. Uh, the, the community question I wanted to ask you is. Uh, it's very easy for us to understand well, what theater does for community, how community serves theater. Um, it, you are doing something for the community uh, of, on Skid Row, but how about the neighborhood, the the the, uh, the people? Who are your ticket buyers? Where do you? How do you bring people in um, to support these other people who are less fortunate? Where does your well, audience I mean, come from? We don't. We don't. I mean, we don't. We don't sell tickets. Sometimes you know. Sometimes sometimes we perform at a place that does sell tickets, but we we are all of our all of our stuff is free, you know. But uh, uh, but that still goes that still goes back to a, a similar question, which is, do you think in some way you've impacted the larger community, not just the Skid Row community? <clears throat> Have has has this brought any aware, awareness to uh, other people in the area? Um, or don't or don't you really know? You might not know. Well, it has. I would say it has. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, 
I don't, it has, I don't know what to say beyond that. Um, I think, uh, like, for, well, I, I, I have a lot of long stories, but I won't, I won't. Um, well, we, we got time. You can, we can take a, we can take one long story. Well, so, I'll, okay. So, okay. Here's what I'll say, not answering your question was that, you know, um, like I, like I said, initially there were a lot of, you know, there were a lot of people who had artistic uh, project, projects going on and there was absolutely, we were the first artistic activity, ongoing activity in Skid Row. And for many years after that, you know, there were really no, uh, very few places for people to make work, you know. And if, like if people were drumming on the streets, the police would come and take away their drums, you know. And so, so there, you know, there it was very, and if, if there was a kind of like a, an arts program or something, it would be inside of a, a mission. And then only, and then unless you were in their program, you couldn't go there, you know. So we were, we were about being open to anybody in the community. And we were also, um, it was important to me that um, if we, if we were going, getting, obliquely to your question, Bob, if we were going to influence the larger community's sense of, of, of what the, the issues are, then it was important to have an open container where people, because I saw so often people who, you know, if you, you could have a bed at the mission, but if you didn't act right, you were out on the street. You could do this, but if you didn't act right, you were out, you were out, you were out. So at LAPD, we tried to make it you are in, you are in, you are in, you know, and really have um, have an inclusive representation of the community. And, uh, and, we, and we, were able to, we were able to do that without any uh, terrible negative consequences, you know. So, um, so that created a bigger picture of the, of the of, I think of the, of the, of the, of the infinite uh, and unique capacity of every person involved. Yeah. So, um, how is how have you kept this running for thirty years? Do you do you have any costs that you have to cover? Um, well, it's been a little bit of a miracle, yeah. I mean, I think originally, um, <laughs> one of our big one of our big strategies was we. I grew up in Chicago we, and right. So let, let me just say something. You, you say you say we. So you're not doing this alone. Do you have other, other people that work work with you on, on, in running this? Now, yeah, yeah, a lot, yeah. I'll tell you. I'll I'll tell you about it. We do a lot. We do quite a bit of quite a few things now. But um, for years, you know, we didn't we didn't we rehearsed in uh, community spaces. So first inner city law for about ten years. We just pushed the desks out of the way when the lawyers weren't there, and then in other community spaces. Um, like a computer room at, at, at one of the day centers and different kinds of things. So we never had to pay. We never had to pay rent in that sense, you know, and um, and that that made it possible to survive. And then, um, yeah, and then, um, but we did. We did at at a certain point. We became. We we did. Um, somebody invited us inside, and we made a couple shows here. One of which became. A big underground hit in Los Angeles and ran, ran for quite a while, actually. And uh, and uh, so and then we then people started inviting us other places. Like, oh, everyone had the everyone had a McDonald's kind of idea, you know, that like this is just like a some Mick franchisable format, you know, and that you can just you know invite us to your city with with and 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 produce us, you know, and then and well, then hypothetically, then, philosophically, it sounds like a wonderful idea. That, then miraculously, something is going to stay there and continue yeah. for the next you know, forever. And that's that's it's really only about determination and willpower. It's not about resources at all. And the way you know there were a few. So, but anyway, we did a lot of we did a lot of traveling and projects where we would go somewhere for six weeks and recruit local. Six of us, uh, the uh, the typical format was six people from our group would go to another place for six weeks. We'd we'd 
make a connect. We'd be invited by an art space. We'd make connections with uh, uh, shelters or or be in the neighborhood where 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 a lot of homeless people were. We'd recruit people, and we'd make a performance about uh, their place. And that became known as LAPD inspects America: colon the name of your city. And um, and so we did a lot of places. We did it in Philadelphia, for example, with the Painted Bride, and uh, and Project Home, which is a which is a fabulous big organization now. But but at that time, we, they had an empty house that we just put mattresses on the floor and stayed there for six weeks while we made this performance. Um, and uh, from a business anyway, so the, I I want to I want to say something. I mean, from a business point of view, obviously this I I don't know how you how you can you know can justify this but from a social consciousness point of view it seems like there's a lot of there's a lot of value it's it's in, in other words um you know people wanted let me ask you a different question okay. have any of the people that have been in your program um improved improved their lot improved themselves uh, got out of gotten out of skid row through being involved in this or is this purely a way of serving people who are just have nothing else that 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 supports them? It, it, it's such a specific thing that you do. It's so special. Well, there, there, in answer to your question, some people, some yes, people have gotten out of Skid Row, but significantly, um, people have organized in Skid Row and improved the conditions. Uh, in in Skid Row as well, so um, and it, which mean which means you know changing sometimes changing policy or or um, uh, creating creating a space for people to do things and things like that. So so it's been part of a it's been part of a a number of uh, grassroots organizations in Skid Row that have really gener built community in Skid Row. So Skid Row has a lot of voice. For example, there are, there are a bunch of things within Skid Row that have that have changed policies citywide. So twice there have been you know a lot of a lot of the housing crisis here and even in New, in New York as well is around the demolition of SRO hotels. You know in the in the up to the 60s and 70s there were a lot of you know just those were places where retired people without much money could live. For example, and then in most cities they were pretty much all knocked down, right? And um, and developed into something else. So in Skid Row, there was there was uh, actually, uh, it came out of some of these same people at the Catholic Worker and other people. We were able to save save the all the housing within Skid Row. So none of the houses were, none of the hotels, 60 hotels or so were demolished. They were instead taken over by a nonprofit that was created uh, to, and then an, another one was created after that that renovated the hotels and and uh, attempted to create safe uh, housing and supportive housing and stuff. Like and this was from so, from people that were in your group who who were empowered at, uh, to some degree and were able to start uh, um, advocating for themselves. Before, it happened before our group, but then subsequently, yeah, a lot of a lot of other. There's been a moratorium on on a hotel conversion citywide, and that was initiated by, by another grassroots group in Skid Row that, that some of our people are involved in. Um, most recent, over the last four or five or six years, we've been, we've been in, we did a pro, jumping ahead a little bit, we, we finally ended up getting a space in 2014 called, which is called the Skid Row History Museum and Archive. That's where I'm in the archive right now, the museum is downstairs. And uh, so it's a space where we rehearse, we do exhibitions, we have a movie series, we have an open mic, we have let, uh, we have a, a tenth group that's meeting from one of the hotels. We have a lot of, we let community members use it for different projects of their own and all that. And the, but the first exhibition we did in this location of that, this is the second location we've had, was, uh, was a playable miniature golf course themed on um, zoning and land use. And the reason was because uh, there was a new community plan and zoning code going into effect for Los Angeles. And we were afraid it was going to displace uh, people in Skid Row. And so 
you know, the back, so we made a playable miniature golf course. We called the project the back nine because, uh, you know, the the zoning process and there is a public process, but oftentimes the in public processes, the um, the assumptions that are baked in early, before the public process starts sort of determine the outcome. And those are things that happen on the back nine, you know, in other words, at the country club or in any private setting where where people decide what the parameters of the public conversation are going to be limited to. So we made a, a playable miniature golf course. Um, the, each hole was zoning themed and uh, and history of Skid Row themed. And then the audio, the the people could come in for six months and play this course and find out about it. Meanwhile, in rehearsals, we made a performance about, uh, also called the Back Nine, uh, which was about, um, yeah, about land. It was about displacement or, or versus community. And um, and so for a couple of weekends, we play, we performed that and then people sat in chairs around the rest of the space watching us. So that, that comes back to my an earlier question, which was I was asking, who is the audience? Because when you said that you rehearsed this and they perform it, I mean, I was getting the, the impression that this was something that was just very insular. The, these the people were, were were working together and performing for each other. Now it sounds like there's something where there might be an, an audience from the community or no, or is it? There's an audience, yeah, there's an audience from, a mixed audience from Skid Row and from the rest of downtown and beyond in LA. Oh, and good. Because um, that's uh, what I thought. Also, but, that's, what I, that's what I kind of thought, but then earlier you said there's no audience. I thought, well, all right, I'm not sure how this works, but little by little I'm getting it. Know. Yeah. No, we, you know, we perform like, I mean, we, you know, we do perform before audiences of, uh, you know, there were in, uh, there was a, there was a retrospective, for example, on our work at the Queens Museum that happened, I don't know what. Uh, at the Queens Museum here? Oh, yeah, yeah. And we had, uh, we did two performances and we performed two different pieces there. One um, called State of Incarceration, one, one of the, in the exhibition, one of the galleries was filled with prison bunk beds, and we had made a performance uh, using where the where whatever space is in is filled with prison bunk beds. It was about prison overcrowding, which was an issue in California that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And we made a performance where the audience sits on the beds, we sit on the beds, we perform in the, on the beds and in the little spaces between the beds, and we did that performance. Uh, we did that performance at, uh, at at a theater festival here in LA, and we did it at the Queens Museum, and we did it at universities, and we did it at the Hammer Museum in LA. I don't know, maybe we did we did something else at the Hammer Museum. Uh -huh. But we so you know we we perform at Red Cat if you know Red Cat Theater here, which is in Disney Hall. It's it's a Cal Arts facility. So do, you have, do main, you have a do you have a core group of people that per, that perform with you? Do you have a core group of people that perform with you, or is it always changing? Well, it's both. There's, you know, people, people, there are people who have been in the group for a really long time, and then we're always happy when someone new walks in the door. So it's, it's a, it's, it's both. Yeah. Um, we have a couple questions. Uh, well, actually, let's start with Kathy Hammer's question, because it goes back to something you were saying before. She wants to know what was the title of the underground hit in LA and about what year was it performed? Oh, it was called No Stone for Stud Schwartz. And it was in, uh, 1980, it was first performed in 1987 and then again in 1988, something like that. No stone for Stud Schwartz, is that right? Oh, Stud Schwartz, yeah. Okay, Stud Schwartz, S T U G. Okay. S T U D S, Studs, like in Studs Lonigan. Oh, um, Studs Schwartz. Okay. Yeah. Now, Tita wants to know. And it was. Okay, you go. Keep going. Well, um, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a performance with about fifteen people in the cast, and it, it came about um, one of the people, one of the people in the group who who had lived in New he grew up in New York, he, um, he but he was sleeping at the edge of Chinatown, and he was um, he could get very agitated, and uh, Chinatown is not far from Skid Row, and at that time there were about three uh, point blank killings, you know, with guns of people living on the 
on the outskirts of downtown like he was. And uh, and he had come up with this this sort of B-movie uh, 10 minute uh, story about about a guy was organi who organized the wrong union. He was supposed to be organizing for the Teamsters and instead he organized for the AFL-CIO and so therefore the Teamsters were chasing him all around the world. And um, and so I so I, I I wrapped a Sunset Boulevard uh, wrapper around that, so that so that at the beginning of the performance there was somebody lying dead in Union Station, which is right near where he was sleeping, and um, and then the guy gets up and he tells uh, the story, just like the narrator and you know in, in Sunset Boulevard is in fact the dead guy in the pool at the beginning of the movie. Hey, William, and William. then um, yeah, and so. So it, it was, you know, they considered the vulnerability of someone uh, like him who was living at the, who was a volatile sort of, uh, you know, he had his ups and downs and, and he was living in a, in a, in a, around the place where people uh, were, were getting uh, killed just for living on, just for sleeping on the street. So, um, so that was, that was the performance. And, um, and like I said, it wasn't scripted. It was only a scenario. So each night it changed. Everybody sat in the audience and came out and did their roles and went back. If he got bogged down in the narration, um, I played the stunt double, so I would go in and take over from him, and that would make him very irritated. So he'd kick me out, and then things would move forward. And so it was very, it was very the it was, the dynamic of it, but the the energy of it was very uh, uh, true, and that's what made it pop and then it was very funny as well so. um tita has a couple questions um first she wants to know how did you guide theater groups that may have included people with personal mental emotional or substance problems did you ever was how that ever in it? how do you guide them how did you how did you keep them focused and how did you keep them part of the group um did you ever did you ever have any problems with people that were that were dealing with with emotional problems or mental problems Well, or the, I mean, or those that were just just not the people that were just not the ones that, that that gravitated to the group. Well, there were plenty of such people, you know, and and uh, in fact, when I was a, I was able to do one workshop at the very beginning of the week at the, at the first uh, day center for for uh, men uh, with emotional problems because there there weren't any other you know there hadn't been any when the when Anyway, it was the first one. So I so a lot of the people in the group, uh, you know, were were actively dealing with emotional problems. I, mean, I don't know. We just, you know, it's it's all about meeting people where they are and just trying to figure your way through. Since so much and, of this and, is, and, so, you know, nobody is nobody, you know, and enjoying the the like I said, it's all about the for me, it's all about the multifaceted uh, capacities of people. You know. Okay. Um, the, the the other question that that Tita asks is, did you focus on anyone else's improvised ideas for entertainment, or did you set up dramatized challenges for them to focus on? Did did, did any of the members of your company ever come up with the ideas, or, or or were these things that you that you did you give them prompts? Well, I mean, I, I just I just mentioned the you know I'm talking about how the genesis of No Stone for Dutch Words, you know this. Uh, Jim came up with this story, not intending it to be anything particularly, and then, then it, um, and then I, I figured out how we could make it into a performance, or, or you know, had an idea, and then we explored all that in the, we just kept exploring it, and eventually it turned out to what it was. So it was. Everybody, you know, made contribute. Everybody makes contributions, and oftentimes, the way we get our, you know, we'll be doing one performance, and someone else will say something about something else, and that'll become, oh yeah, let's make that into our next performance or our next something. So it's definitely like you know, just listening to one another and seeing where, the, and listening to one another and being aware of what the issues are in the community and and and. Uh, um, Ross asked pretty, something that, that that sort of was in my my head as well. Um, how 
if you don't script your things, uh, if you don't script things, do you, is there a way for them? Do you ever replicate them, or are they able to be replicated? Have you ever considered scripting them? Even pr improv can probably be scripted in a way, just in terms of, you know, suggesting what the prompts were and what the what the key issues are that you're dealing with, or some way of well, putting it into words. Well, we have most everything on video. We have everything on videotape. So we've actually we've created, you know, we like some like that show we put together a couple of times. There was a call a show called Call Home that we put together a number of times. And we we uh transcribe with Call Home, we like transcribed the performance and then that became the script that we used uh later on. Okay, so you do sometimes trans transcribe the performances and, and have something that, that now we that can be replicated. More, is... Yeah, more recently, we, I mean, in the last, the, fir the first time we started using script, we used, we used found scripts, meaning um, I got a, I used a congressional hearing, a, a congressional hearing that I gotten from Maxine Waters um, that I reduced a little bit. And, and then we, we performed that. So all the, see, with everyone in the, everyone in the company playing either um, a member, well, it was, it was a hearing about whether the CIA had been involved in bringing crack cocaine into LA to finance the Contras in the 80s. And so everybody played a, a someone in the House of Representatives or the CIA lawyer. And uh, and the, it was verbatim from those people. So you do do ver verbatim um, uh, works. Um, one of Jane Dubin but, was one of the producers of, of um, Is This a Room, which was a, ver a verbatim piece and uh, two for beta pieces the other one i forget what the other one was um i don't think james is james is still here so anyway so anyway so you do for so, so part of your you have a you have a big palette it sounds like you have a lot of tools that you, that you use it's not just one thing so you uh, oh, gotta keep, you know, we gotta keep making it interesting right so yeah. you have to look, if you want to if a project keeps going for a while you got to keep figuring out new ways to do it otherwise you know you have to keep it interesting so most recently, like when I mentioned the the miniature golf performance, um, we we've we've most of the stuff we do is, is scripted that we develop improvisationally, but then then it's scripted. So that's that's the way we've been operating a lot recently. Well, the thing that that really impresses me is that you've been doing this for thirty nine years. So there's obviously dedication, and you are passionately you passionately believe in what you're doing um, how has it been sustainable i mean do you have do you get government grants to get any funding uh you don't charge for tickets so there's there's no there's no ticketing involved yeah, no, it's, you know, it's there's a no big, income it's, it's, a big, it's a big accident you know i mean like i said you know at the beginning we had um you know i was working full-time for legal aid we had a little bit of money from the california arts council Later on, we, you know, then we started doing all these touring things and I quit working my day job. But then um, I started, I was either getting some support from LAPD, but also teaching and doing other things, other performing. And then, uh, and then, you know, at a certain point, we really, we really didn't have any money again. And I started a huge project somewhere else. And then, uh, but, but we were doing uh, the project agents and assets, the one I just mentioned. Um, and that, and what, and while working on something else, we were able to generate some, some gigs for that and some support for that. And so, so you, then you, that started. You personally have? You, do you have a? Do you have a day job? Do you, have, do you have other things that you do to support yourself, or do you support yourself through this? Right now, I, I right now I mainly support myself through this. But for most year, most of the time, for many years, I, I I either had a, well, like I said, at first I was working for inner city law, then I was getting supported by this and other arts gigs. And then I uh, started this other project that was supporting me and allowing me to keep LAPD going uh, without any money in LAPD pretty much. And then, um, and then when, I, but then more recently, uh, yeah, LAPD started getting, we get a lot of, we get grant support and we also, you know, we get, we, over the, we've gotten, you know, theater support, obviously. We get visual arts support, we get, um, uh, um, what's it called? Like public humanities support. 
we started when I when I decided to have this um, to have have a space which we call this Goodrow History Museum and Archive, like I said, where we have exhibitions, we rehearse, we perform, we let other people use it, we show movies, we do panels and all that. Um, and we have an archive of of not only artwork but Skid Row history. Um, so we also get support from from archiving. So it's just sort of been, you know, intuition. Sometimes has been good and has been has been uh, rewarded with discovering a new income stream. But right now, we get, most of our support is grant supports, but all from all these different sectors. Well, that's amazing. Um, I want to open up to the room. Uh... For, for for other questions, if anybody else has questions, I think RK had something. I, I think I saw. Where was it? Um, oh no, that was Ross. Um, any anyone else want to ask John something or want to comment on this? Uh, what, what you what you do is just kind of amazing. Um, I the fact that you sustained it for 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 thirty nine years is astonishing, Catherine. Catherine Keats. Hi. I'm going to try to talk without crying. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm not going to cry. I swear to God. John, it's so moving what you're doing. Um, and the way you've had the ability to uh, take, uh, meet people where they are is profound and to um, allow artists and people who are struggling with the issues that people who are unhoused um, and the amount of creativity that many of the people have who are uh, have come to the the place of being unhoused Obviously, I am speaking from some experience, um, not that I've been unhoused, but I do have a son who, when he was living, experienced these things and um, was an artist. So thank you for your work and thank you for allowing this group of people to, to speak because there is so much that they have to say. And in response to the question, are, are you doing something to feed the community in a bigger way, the hope that you're giving the community in a bigger way is, is immense to the families, to uh, the critical kind of situation that we are in right now with, with mental health, with addiction, um, with what happened in the pandemic, with all of the rooms closing, with all of the 12 step rooms closing, so mazel to you this is huge so thank you i just want to say that and if there's anything i can do to be of service i am certainly there you know so thank you for your work and your many many i can't even imagine what it's like now as things have grown in the unhoused culture so that's what i want to say thanks thanks catherine john you are uh, Bob, I think somebody else had a question in the chat first. I didn't want to skip anybody. Um, oh, Ellen Clarkson wants to know, are any of the LAPT performances videos online? Is there a link to find your videos? We have, you know, we, we have, a, we have a hugely extensive website. Um, you, you know, you can Google. So, you know, so tell, tell, uh, tell Ross what, what the website is. Just say it to him. He'll, he'll, he'll type it into the, into the chat well, so people can get it. It's, uh, www. You're in and out. You're in and out. LA Poverty. LA Poverty. Dept. D E P T. Dot org. LA Poverty. Sorry, could you say that again? So LA Poverty. Dot. What? No, no. Dept. Dept. D E P T. D E P T. Like short, the short for department. Got it. Dot org. Dot org. Dot org. Is it a dot org? John is a yeah, dot org. So, okay. yes. So it's hugely extensive. You can see a lot of the performances and exhibitions, everything from 
you know, 2000 on, you, know, you can't see the old stuff too much. Um, <laughs> 2000 on is a lot of years. Doesn't seem like that to somebody who's been doing it for 30, 39, but yeah, it's pretty amazing. Okay, John, your turn. Hi, John. Um, thanks for doing this presentation. It's very noble. Um, I have a question for you. Um, the show that I'm passionate about that I would like to produce on Broadway, it gives homeless people a tremendous voice. The main character basically, you know, got into some trouble and um, went to prison and just sort of after he got out, he took on a life of the streets. So this guy is someone that was supposed to have a Ph.D. He is very incredible. And with the show, I want to be known as the show that recoups and feeds a homeless uh, a million homeless people. And I want to like sort of tie that mission to, you know, maybe like fiscal sponsors and corporations to buy into it. And I want to know what are some organizations that you think I, I could potentially look into to help facilitate the mission? Because I've always heard things like clean socks are one of the primary primary things that homeless people ask for. And I don't know if that's exactly what you do, but I just you know want to see if you had any pointers. I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure what you say it again. What you're looking for? You're looking uh, for he's, he's looking for resources that you might be aware of that could help support him in his uh, trying to bring uh, a show that has a strong homeless uh, aspect to it. Uh, 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 the, a show that that in some way wants to raise awareness about homelessness. And he was wondering whether there are any resources that you know that would that might want that what might be willing to support the development of a piece like this. All right. I you, you um, actually, John. I have to say, you 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 uh, started off in the wrong direction when you said that you want want to bring it to Broadway. I know that your ultimate goal is that you want to bring a, a show to Broadway that will make money, and you want to use the profits from the show. To somehow support yeah, the no, homeless. I, understand that. I, understand that. I don't. I don't know. I think. Um, oh, but the, the reason, John. The reason I'm John's. The reason I'm saying that it's it was wrong to start is because the um, not for profits uh, and charitable organizations and like that don't necessarily support the commercial theater. Uh, it, it, they might support you in your development process, but they may not they may not support a commercial production. I, I don't know that they would. But you might know better, John, John, John Malpied, you might know better than I do. I don't, well, of course, I don't, I don't really have any idea about that because we don't operate in that. Yeah, he's, yeah. Not, he's, he's, not, yeah. he's not in that area, so. But I mean, I, I think, I don't, I don't know, I, I would, I mean, there are foundations, obviously, in New York that 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 are dealing with homelessness, and they're also the the on the ground, you know, organization. Then you might you might talk to and just sort of get a sense of where. I don't know. It's I, I you'd go inch by inch, is what I would say. Talk to you know, meet people and there and see what you can figure out one step at a time because. I'm sorry that that isn't a very, very useful. Uh, there's no not much insight there. But, well, you're you're coming from two different two different I mean, ends of the spectrum, so. And there are probably a lot of people who, who do support Broadway productions that that are also would be very inclined to, uh, you know, be concerned about about this issue and maybe su support you and you and you could try and figure out. You know how to research that and figure out who those people are. But I bet I bet there's a probably a lot of overlap between people that's that fun Broadway shows and they're also concerned about giving, you know, they might be interested in giving to your I think it's it's just the, the span from from what you what you do to to uh to Broadway. It's just a big it's a big span and it's hard to imagine. I I don't know, there might be a company there might be some companies that are that have the vision to to support something like that, but it's uh, it's a big it's a big idea, John. Um, anyone else have have any other questions or comments? Please, guys, uh, love to hear from you. I'll look for 
virtual hand raises or I'll just look for you to turn on your mic and start talking. Well, in that case, it's 6.30 and it's time for me to say my farewells. Um, John Melpied, thank you for being with us. I appreciate it very much. I, Like I said, I'm always looking for people that, that do interesting things that are theater related and you certainly are to me, you're a one of a kind, but I'm sure that there, there, there are other people that, that are equally involved in this in the community. I know a lot of pe people in theater who are community minded, minded but for them, it means uh, engaging the community in, in the work they do, social socially relevant pieces that engage the community. Um, and that's their audiences, but um, their audiences also become people that are involved in the social issues that they're dealing with. Like Jane's company, Houses on the Moon, is very socially conscious. New York rep, uh, Gail Waxenberg, uh, their their mission is very socially oriented too. But these are all structured companies that 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 do performances um, not as often as you do. You do an ongoing an ongoing series of opportunities for your community, your your homeless community, to be engaged and to feel worthwhile um, instead of just, you know, being homeless and, and, and hopeless. So uh, I, 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 tr I sense that you've really given a lot of people hope that may not be, have been living with much hope before. And you've given them a sense of self too. Um, so thank you for all you do. And uh, thank you for the community that's here. And I'm gonna go off for one second and say a few final words to my virtual audience, um, if you're out there on YouTube and you, you, you find us, or or if you eventually find us on our podcast and True Talks About Theater, um, and you don't know who we are, we are Theater Resources Unlimited. And we basically try to support people in understanding and navigating the business of the arts. And uh, if you wanna be part of the conversations, I can make that happen. Um, so email me at T-R-U-N-L-T-D, T-R-U-N, ltd at aol.com and um i'll put you on a zoom list and you'll i'll invite you every week so this is the 191st uh, consecutive one that i've done and always looking for people with interesting things to say if you have any ideas about people you'd like to like to meet and have me interview um send them to me at t-r-u-n-l-t-d at aol.com it's t-r-u-n-l-t-d at aol.com and if you want to support the work that we're doing um this is a community service. Anybody can come for free. I don't. I don't require that people come uh, and pay. But if you can pay, uh, particularly if you're not a member of True, uh, we would love it if you give us some support. Go to truedonate.com, tru-donate.com, and uh, give us a little support to sweep us into a new year, 2024. Here we go. I got 52 more of these to go. Um, I hope you'll all join us and hope to see you in weeks to come. Thank you.